Thanks very much for that introduction, and, and uh, thanks too for the, uh, the opportunity to give our Pare Karaka, a spotted shag, a voice, and to uh, just enlighten you on the status of this, of this species, which I suppose after the fairy turn is probably our rarest seabird in the Haraki Gulf, I think. So a very special species. And uh, so here we go, a few more details about what we've been up to and, and uh, what the status of the spotted shag is. Now, we're sitting here in Auckland in a real hot spot for the shag or cormorant species, and you're probably very familiar with the pied shag, the big black and white one you see around the, around the coastline of the city. And uh, you'll probably occasionally see the black shag, also the little shag, which is a smaller version of the pied, if you like, in coloration, and the little black shag, and that's the one that um, has quite an interesting life history. It breeds down, the, if you go to the Polynesian pools at Rotorua and peer out across the lake, there's some little islands in Sulphur Bay, and the little black shags breed there, but then they come up and, and spend the winter in the northern harbours and have that marvellous leapfrogging feeding behaviour where the whole flock sort of forms a, a bunch and they leapfrog each other as they, as they pursue swarm, uh, schools of fish, right up in places like Shoal Bay and, and in parts of the harbour. And if you're down at Chelsea Sugarworks in the evenings, you'll see the flocks and these skeins of little black shags flying in and roosting in the big carnica and pine trees up at the back of the, uh, the lakes at the uh, Chelsea refinery. Anyway, down on the right-hand side there, the lower right, is, is our spotted shag, and really, you know, it's a really spectacular species, and uh, most elegant and, and, uh, and um, spectacular shag we have in New Zealand. And it has a relative in the Chatham Islands, the, the rare Pitt Island shag. Around New Zealand, the uh, spotted shag isn't um, threatened, especially in the South Island. It's a very common species around the South Island coast, especially in the east and, the, and uh, up around the um, Golden Bay area. And there's huge colonies on Banks Peninsula and around the Otago Peninsula, and also up off um, Pohara up in, in the Golden Bay. However, there's a big gap in the distribution in the North Island. There's the northern, northern population around the Auckland region and West Waikato previously, and the Haraki, in the Haraki Gulf. And then you go all the way south to Carpety and Wellington for the next nearest spotted shag populations. So quite a curious distribution in New Zealand. In the old days, it used to be in the Bay of Islands, so um, that's retreated from some of these northern sites. The really interesting thing which has been uh, discovered recently by Nick Rawlins and, and co at the University of Otago is that the northern spotted shag actually is quite genetically distinct from the remaining, remaining spotted shags around New Zealand. And the genetic work also shows that the Pitt Island shag I mentioned before in the Chatham is actually an offshoot from this northern population. So here we have this little enclave up here in the north of genetically distinct spotted shags. And I think you know, because of that genetic um, uniqueness, they really should be um, upgraded as far as their threat status goes. And, and we could really think of them as being regionally endangered in view of the numbers we've got left. So we started a series of surveys in 2013 and after we identified the spotted shag as being a species of priority for research. And we used the historic distribution of breeding sites as, as a starting point for our surveys. So that in the 19, through the 1940s to the 1990s, we had about 13 separate colonies, um, the southernmost one being at, down the West Waikato, um, south of Port Waikato. Then two or three sites off the, uh, the Tehinga Bethel's coastline, Mirawai, and then the remainder over in the Haraki Gulf and on the Coromandel Islands. So I'll just take you for a wee bit of a ticky tour around some of these sites. So up here we've got the, on the top uh, left is a spectacular site down off um, Waikaritu uh, um, on the west Waikato where there's a, these big basalt columns and there were 250 spotted shags breeding there up through to the 1970s. And the South Auckland branch of the Ornithological Society surveyed that uh, in 2014 and found none at all there. Uh, then the uh, other one on the top right is the, is the traditional Ihumoana Bluff at, uh, out at Bethel's Beach, Tihinga. And we used to have 150 odd nesting on that big craggy conglomerate uh, cliff face there. And again, there are none left there. Graham Taylor saw the last pair breeding there in the 1999-2000 season. And I regularly used to see them in the Manukau. I was one of my um, beats for the Ornithological Society's Manukau census is the Mangari Inlet, and regularly at Port Hunger, there'd be a lovely little bunch of wintering spotted shags in the, in the harbour there, uh, right up at Port Hunger, uh, roosting on the groins and, and uh, piles around the, um, around the port. 
And then at Murawai, at the Gannett Colony, if you look out to Araya Island, that's another site which used to have a colony out there offshore from Murawai. And again, all three sites now, there are no birds at all there. So, and as I say, the last bird we, we saw in the Manukau was in 2008. Now moving over into the Gulf, uh, Otata and the, the David Rocks, the two sites there on the left, uh, traditionally had uh, spotted shag breeding colonies. So we had a colony on the northern side of Otata and one in this cave on, on the David Rocks. And uh, around about uh, probably two to three hundred pairs based at those two sites. Another place they used to be seen regularly, up to 500 birds, was on the northern end of Ponui Island and the reef shown on the top right there, which is Scully Reef was a, a very well used roost for many years and again we, d we just don't see birds there at all now. And Horu Horu Rock out off the northern northeastern tip of uh, Waiheke where the Gannett Colony is located was also another breeding site with a few pairs on it. So all of those sites are now abandoned. But the stronghold we've got left is Tarahiki which is out off the northeastern end of Waiheke and there are two also two colonies on the eastern end of Waiheke, which are still going at Anita Bay and Hooks Bay. So there's a, a few scenes of Taraheke Island. It's a real gem. It's got a little cap of forest on it. And the craggy coastline with little indented coves and, and, and sea caves is the stronghold for the, uh, you know, the remaining population of the, of the spotted shag. We've got around about 200 to 230 pairs on, on Taraheke. So here at Tarahiki on the, on the, in the little coves on the northeastern side, it's a marvellous place to explore with a kayak. Uh, you can sort of nose into these very deep little inlets in the island and uh, explore the sea caves and, and, and the coves there. And the shags are all spread out on these little crags all around that northeastern side. Usually when we go out there, we take Brian Shields from our biosecurity team with his trained rodent dog, and Brian gives the dog a wee run over the island because uh, it used to have Norway rats on it which were removed about 10 years ago. And we do a regular check just to maintain, or at least to check that we know we're maintaining that rat-free status of the island to make sure everything's secure. So you know, a bit of a sniff around with the dog, we're gonna soon know if there's a rat ashore there. But so far, so good. And the nice thing about Tarahiki, it's, it's well enough separated from Waiheke that the swimming distance is really almost outside the range that even a Norway rat can easily reach. So it's a, a pretty rare event when a rat would get there anyway. Now we've moved across to the northeastern side of Waiheke to Anita Bay where there's a big detached stack and that's got about uh, 60 odd pairs on it and it's been a long established breeding site on the northeastern side of Waiheke. And then just around the corner from Anita Bay is, is Hooks Bay where there's a, a sloping shelf of, bass, of uh, grey wacky rather coming down into the sea which has around about 40 odd pairs on it. So those, those are the three sites, that's all we've got left out of that 13 that I showed you previously around the Auckland and Waikato regions. Now in 2015 we surveyed the Coromandel Islands and this was really a big stronghold uh, up and through into the 1970s and 1980s for the species in the inner part of the Gulf and uh, upwards of 2,200 birds along the Coromandel chain with about four of the islands as major breeding sites. We found absolutely nothing there at all so that population has totally collapsed. And when you drive up the coast road from Thames to Coromandel Town, you, know, you often see spotted shags on the rocks, and I've always assumed over the years that those were the Coromandel Island birds that were coming down to roost on that stretch of coast, but it doesn't seem to be the case. With the uh, Coromandel survey, I got onto Google Earth and, and uh, looked at the, all the islands, the aerial photographs of the islands, and tried to work out where you know, these colonies might have been, and, and I could see sort of white patches showing up on some of them. And uh, so we made a point of visiting all those places, but they just turned out to be eroded rock faces or, or slips or whatever, and, and certainly no recent sign whatsoever. Because as you recall, that shot I showed of Tarahiki and, and uh, Anita Bay, the stacks are very characteristic when they've got shags on them with the, the whitewash of guano all over them, so you can see them from a distance and even show up well in aerial photographs. Also, as we used to go down the coast, if we drove down that wonderful coast road from um, you know, Clevedon down to Miranda, uh, the spotted shags used to be a regular feature along the coast there. And uh, from Oruri Point and Tarata Point south to uh, Whakatiwai, where the old Hinau, the old minesweepers, pulled up on the foreshore there. And I recall seeing about 100 spotted shags just perched on the gunnels of the old hulk and also on the wharf opposite there. It's the major roost of the birds that would come down into the Firth of Thames to, to fish along that coast. But 
Again, we just don't see them there anymore. So what's going on on the Thames coast? I mentioned you know you can drive up that coast road and, and uh, see today numerous spotted shags along the coastline. They're perched on the rocks uh, quite close to the road. And it's very easy to get really close to them. There are places there where you can, can just pull off on the road and just lean over the bank and look right down. It's almost close enough you can poke them with a stick. They're so, so placid and tame. You get really marvellous views of them. So while we were doing our surveys on Tarahiki, I, I got Ian Salvi from the, the Ornithological Society to do a simultaneous count on the, on the Thames coast. We weren't really sure where those ones are coming from. And as it turned out, when we weren't seeing birds on, on Tarahiki and at Waiheke, there were 500 or 600 down the Thames coast and vice versa. Uh, no, the birds were obviously moving to and fro across the Firth, and we were, we're pretty sure we're looking at the same birds. So those are the Tarahiki birds that you see on the Thames coast, roosting in the off-season and fishing along that stretch of coastline. So here we are tracking the changes in these colonies over the years, and uh, there, there are enough records from the early part of the 20th century to, to put some dots on the map, and uh, that's the top left corner there. In the 1940s, we had more widespread protection of native species, and, and uh, so there's far less persecution of, of shags, and there's the old, the old problem, of course, uh, fishermen look at the shag and think, well, shags eat, eat fish, so let's shoot the shags. And uh, so they suffered horrendous persecution in the early days. And there's a, there, there was a marked recovery during the 1940s to the 1990 period. But then, since uh, about 2000, we've had this catastrophic decline. And uh, so the 13 colonies we had up until the early 1990s is now reduced to just three. Now here's a bit of a summary of, of, of uh, our findings compared with what we had previously. So uh, um, going around those various sites, you can see the size of those various colonies, <clears throat> those 13 colonies I mentioned before or thereabouts with uh, no, quite good, good healthy populations now being reduced to the 500-odd uh, birds based around Tarahiki, say 200, 230-odd pairs, and then the, uh, the two other sites at the eastern end of Waiheke at Anita Bay and Hooks Bay. We were out there last Monday, actually, had a marvellous day out on the Gulf. The sea was flat, calm, and we went out, and for the first time, we had a, a photographer with us, Damien Christie, came along and brought his drone. And we always thought that a drone would be a, a really good way to survey the birds because the crags of Tarahiki are very precipitous, and we can't actually see the tops of them very clearly and get a good, accurate count. And I was, I was uh, really interested to see how they'd respond, and, and there are a very placid species and that they sort of craned around a bit when this weird object started flying out just behind us and it was looking towards us and the crags behind getting this wonderful footage of, of us doing the survey and I could see that a future trip you know we should take a drone out there and try and get a really accurate survey you know, could route around the island probably in five minutes and then come back later on and get a really accurate nest count all our Surveys so far are very much boat based, so we're, we're um, bobbing about in the boat and trying to hold our binoculars steady and, and you know, get a half decent count. So it's a bit of a challenge, it's a bit of an approximation really, but uh, when we've been comparing our counts over the years, they are actually reasonably consistent. So we're getting, a, certainly from the boat based perspective, you know, quite a, um, a good stab at what's there. But a drone would be handy for a future survey, and knowing that this, the shags are quite tolerant of, of one, uh, we think it could be feasible. Anyway, so what, what, what's been going on? Now, why, why are we seeing these, these uh, enormous declines? And uh, could it be climatic? Is it you know, human disturbance? Have predators had some impact? Uh, what about shooting over the years? And what about set nets? Now, we really, uh, to, to, find, to find out data on where recreational set netting goes on, for instance, and what the bycatch is, it's just a stab in the dark. We really don't know what's going on. Um, is overfishing having some impact? Um, and you know, how are there natural fluctuations in fish stocks which are causing problems? So with the present distribution and thinking of climatic uh, reasons and the, you know, the gradual warming of the sea temperature and so forth, they are actually at the northern end of their range at the moment. So are we looking at a southern species that's you know, really just sitting there on its northern end of the range and is now, it's possibly marginal in the you know, warmer seas of northern New Zealand as far as uh, um, maintaining a, a viable populations goes. There's been interesting work done, Jim Mills for many years has worked on the Red Bull Gulls at Kaikoura, and even down there, the warming seas, he's blamed that on the decline of the Kaikoura colony. 
and the types of food the euphorsids they feed on offshore, those, the, the distribution of those has changed to a, a more southerly distribution and, and um, the colonies around Otago Peninsula of red bill gulls have increased at the expense of the Kaikoura one, which has, has declined. So a suggestion of a, of a, of a southward shift in red bill gulls. And what about disturbance? Well, Tarahiki certainly is a little craggy, you know, fairly remote little island, and, and we don't think that disturbance is, a, is an issue there. And it's, it's actually, you know, the places that the birds are nesting are these precipitous crags around the island, and really is a really difficult place to land on. So uh, we don't think that that's an issue. And even at the eastern end of Waiheke, at Anita Bay and Hooks Bay too, they're, they're not really that accessible, certainly not from the land. Um, you know, possibly somebody could harass them from a boat, but uh, we haven't really seen much evidence for that. And what about predation? You know, uh, I mentioned before we, we run the rodent dog over Tarahiki, so it's, it's, we've kept the uh, rodent-free status there, so it's not an issue on Tarahiki. Although on Waiheke is quite interesting. Um, that, of course, is you know, a mainland, almost a mainland site you regarded as, as far as the suite of introduced predators that are there, rats and stoats, feral cats and so forth. Those two sites are you know, certainly very vulnerable to predation, and I'll show you a little clip later on. Of we put a game camera on, on the Anita Bay stack in, in June just to see what was going on. Sorry? We can play it now if you like. Can we do that now? Or I can play it at the end if you like, it's okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, now those Waiheke sites are potentially more vulnerable to, to predators. And certainly shooting was a big issue in the old days, and, and Jeff Buddle, who uh, did a lot of work around the Harrogate Gulf and take wonder, took wonderful photographs through the, 19, uh, the 1920s, 30s and 40s, uh, recounts um, a trip he did down to Waiheke on a yacht and, and uh, describes two members of the, of the crew armed with shotguns amused themselves for hours practising on the flying birds. Shooting went on until the cartridges, all cartridges cartridges were expended and probably a hundred or more dead or dying birds were left lying in the water. So this is the sort of stuff that was going on. They just went out you know, for sport and had a crack at these birds. It's no longer a serious problem and so, so I don't think shooting is an issue these days, although you know, there is the old adage you know, amongst fishermen that shags eat fish, let's get rid of the shags and it's, uh, it's potentially an issue. And we have occasionally recovered birds with gunshot wounds in, in our beach patrols, but uh, as far as a, you know, a major source of mortality, it, there's no evidence for it now. But certainly it's they're just death traps for all diving birds and we had an incident recently down in Kao Kao Bay where we recovered 200 fluttering shelters from a, a set net. And in Otago Harbour, Chris Lalas did a study over a number of years, had enormous mortality of spotted shags in the inlets in the Otago Harbour in, in, uh, of, of spotted shags. And in the Manukau, uh, Ray Clough, who uh, used to keep a sharp eye on, on the birds around Pukatutu Island, uh, saw a, a couple of set net hauls come in, uh, and a total of dead, 13 dead, drowned spotted shags in these, in these set nets. And I'm thinking that that issue alone in the Manukau, the set nets, could have been singly responsible for the uh, extinction of the, of the Bethel's colony, because those birds wintered in the Manukau harbour, where they and you imagine you know, 150 odd birds, a few set net hauls, and it'd soon make a big hole in the population. What about overfishing and declines in fish stocks? Um, we don't really know you know, for spotted shags, and, and of course the, the, the bait fish species are enormously hard to study, and you know, some of you might be able to help me here, but uh, it's very hard to find information on, on the status of some of these bait fish, you know, like pilchards and anchovies, those populations. Now, occasionally we see big die-offs of pilchards and they all get washed ashore and you know, there could be periodic depletion of food supplies. But what, what effect would it take, though, to wipe out two and a half or 2,200 birds off the Coromandel Islands? Now, would that be a, is that a bigger picture thing, like a, a, a collapse of some significant food supply? Could it have been attrition over time by set netting? Although commercial fishermen I've spoken to say there certainly hasn't been a lot of commercial set netting down that area, but uh, what about the recreational set nets? Uh, and on Banks Peninsula, it was quite interesting, uh, during the 1990s, I think it was, um, there was, um, sorry, 1960s to the 90s, there was a, a bit of a decline in the, in the uh, commercial fishing effort, and spotted shags made a big recovery during that time from about 9,000 to over 20,000 birds, so there's possibly a message in there as to what impact those fisheries could have been having on, on that spotted shag population. Yeah, so I'd love to know about bait fish and what impacts um, have been going on with those because uh, there may be some significance in that, especially regarding the, 
that collapse of the, of the particularly the Coromandel population. The interesting thing right through this though, which is quite extraordinary, is that Taraheke and those two sites of Waiheke, for some reason, right through from the 1980s have been remarkably stable while everything else around them has collapsed. And so what's going on? Why is Taraheke so successful and yet all these other sites are, have declined or, or collapsed totally? Some work that Matt Rain has done recently on the, uh, the diet of shags is quite instructive. And the old specimens from the museum um, show that they ate more fish in the past than they do now. And so the diet has changed. And I was speaking to John Eichelsheim the other day, who's a very keen recreational fisherman, writes extensively in the, in the fishing and boating magazines. And John was telling me, do you realize there's been a change with some of the, the, uh, the uh, shrimp species in the Gulf? We've now got this thing, the greasy back prawn, which is colonizing the Gulf from Australia and now becoming very abundant. And is there a message in there? Are these shags now starting to take these prawns as part of their food supply, which that, that change in the, in the um, stable isotope of nitrogen suggests that the change, the change to crustacea as well as, as, well as fish. So uh, that's an interesting one. I'd be interested to see where that one goes in future. So where to next? Well, uh, uh, obviously we need to protect those remaining colonies and ensure they remain, remain uh, predator-free, especially Tarahiki, and, and obviously advocate for the species and alert people that there is a species out there that's in trouble and that we need to protect them. Uh, it'd be interesting too to, uh, to do some radio tagging just to confirm our observations of where they're going across the Firth of Thames. We're pretty sure those, those are the Tarahiki birds we're seeing on the Thames coastline. And relating back to Tom's talk about uh, marine reserves and, and uh, uh, fishing bans and so forth, uh, I think uh, some sort of recreational set netting ban for a start would be uh, probably a pretty helpful uh, thing for uh, preserving and ensuring that population, for instance, when it's wintering across on the Thames coast is suffering no threat along that stretch of the coastline. And we're also doing, going to try some experimental colony re-establishment, and here's Chris up at Tafranui recently when we were digging burrows to um, install the, uh, the nest boxes for the grey-faced petrel colony. You can see the sound system in the background. So we've had some success with petrels, but what about shags? What can we do with shags? Uh, we've, we've done some work with pied shags in the Oraki Basin where we set up a, um, there was a, a consent for a big boardwalk along the, the um, Oraki Basin and, and as part of that, a platform was built for the pied shags where a roost was threatened. and. Uh, Michael Nartai, one of my colleagues, and I set up uh, some nesting material on the platform to try and encourage the pie checks to use it. But uh, so far, the birds have just been flogging the sticks off our platform to take across to the nearby colony and not even uh, you know, deigning to nest on our platforms, unfortunately. So. But there was a very successful project in Nelson where pied shags on Rocks Road were causing a, um, quite a, an issue with making a mess on the pavements and, and the colony was actually shifted across to Horshore Island, but that involved total destruction of the of, the, of their trees, uh, and the nests were actually chainsawed out of the trees and taken across to Paula Shore, and, and the pied shags moved successfully across to the island to this new site. So it certainly has been achieved with, with the pied shag, but I can't imagine lifting big chunks of Taraheke Island and moving them somewhere else for the spotted shags, which is a you know, specialised cliff nesting species. But uh, um, Rod and Sue are doing this fab fabulous restoration work on the Noises Islands and are really keen to try a, uh, an experiment of, of colony re-establishment at the old site on, on Otata, on the northern side of Otata. And the other day, we pulled into this gorgeous little cove where we identified roughly where the old colony was. And the plan is to 3D print some decoys and uh, set up a sound system like the one I showed you previously for the petrels. Run a speaker down the slope amongst the decoys, put some dummy nests there, splash a bit of whitewash around, and uh, see if we could lure the birds in onto this colony site on a, another safe a secure predator-free island uh, on Otata. Sure. And uh, so we'll, that's, that's, uh, that's our next little project. So uh, we're we'll, we'll hopefully getting onto that this summer. And I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, various people involved with the, the project over the last four or five years. Thanks very much. <laughs>